When you hear thin client, you might be thinking of a little lightweight system with just enough resources to stream from a virtual machine or maybe run a web browser. But this isn't that. This thing has a Ryzen CPU with Vega 8 graphics, upgradable RAM, multiple M.2 slots, a 90 watt power supply, and a PCIe slot. Oh yeah, and I picked it up for just a little over $60. So was it worth it? Well, as always, let's find out. With the system this quirky, it's really easy for me to come up with ideas of how to use it. Gift ideas though? Well, that's a whole different challenge. Fortunately, the sponsor of this video, Ugreen, makes it simple with high quality chargers and power banks that are perfect for anyone on your list. The Ugreen Nexode 100 watt charger is perfect for keeping all of your devices charged, thanks to its four in one multi-port design and wide compatibility. Plus with up to 100 watts of output on just a single port, it charges them fast. Ugreen managed to pack all that power into just a tiny little package thanks to the foldable plug design and more importantly, the gallium nitride chip inside, which is substantially more efficient than traditional silicone based chargers. For on the go charging, the 145 watt power bank is also a great option. It supports power delivery 3.1 and can provide up to 140 watts on just a single port, or you can fast charge three devices simultaneously. With its massive 25,000 milliamp hour capacity, it can completely recharge laptops up to 1.3 times and mobile devices up to 5.2 times. And the digital display shows the exact battery level, keeping you confidently powered on the go. So if you're looking for the best charging solutions for you or for your friends and family, check out the Ugreen Black Friday deals to get up to 40% off. Links are down in the description, so don't miss out. This is the HP T740 Thin client. And like I mentioned in the intro, I picked mine up on eBay for $61 or $80 after tax and shipping, which might be a pretty good deal considering many of these were apparently going for around $200 or $300 just a couple of years ago. The T740 is powered by an AMD embedded V1756B CPU, a quad-core Ryzen-based chip with Vega 8 integrated graphics. Now, the 45 watt TDP on this might be a little bit concerning as I was hoping the system wouldn't draw a ton of power. That being said, TDPs are by no means an indicator of total system power draw. The 90 watt power supply requirement might be though. Although maybe that's just for the extra power needed for the PCIe slot. We'll get to that here in a bit, I guess. The T740 is small, but definitely not as small as you might think for it being a thin client. You can actually see here on Serve the Home that it's actually quite a bit bigger than the sort of typical one liter form factor that you might see from Dell, HP, and Lenovo. On the front, alongside the power button and a combo audio jack, there's one 5 gigabit per second USB type A port, one 10 gigabit per second type A port, and then a 10 gigabit per second type C port. On the back, there's a power jack, a gigabit ethernet port, four display ports, and then two more 5 gigabit per second USB ports, as well as two USB 2.0 ports. My unit also came with this optional DB9 serial connector. Oh yeah, and there's obviously the PCIe slot, which supports low profile single slot cards. And this system came populated with a gigabit LC fiber card. To get this thing cracked open, I grabbed some tools and, oh wait, no, we don't need any of those. All we need to do to open this up is remove this little back plate and then press down on this green button to pop off the top of the case. To really get a good look at everything, you need to remove the PCIe card. And to do that, you just push down on this little black tab and this little thingy slides over and then the card can come out. With the PCIe card out, you can easily get to everything, like the dual DDR4 sodium sockets, one NVMe Gen 3x4 slot, and then another M.2 slot that only supports SATA. One thing that probably isn't quite as easy to get to is this M.2 E key slot for an optional wireless card, because it's sort of covered up by the CPU fan and this little daughter board. Now, typically with a system like this that's a few years old, I would strip it down and clean it up, but it was surprisingly not that dusty. I mean, there was really no dust on the CPU fan or the heatsink, and so I just decided to not worry about it. Taking the CPU fan off did make that M.2 E key slot a bit more accessible, but it still looked like it was going to be blocked by this little daughter board. So I unplugged and unscrewed it, and then kind of laughed at how goofy this looks being at a weird angle. I was also going to remove this other daughter board, but the second ribbon cable was a bit more tricky to get off and I just didn't want to risk damaging it. And the only thing this really kept me from getting to was being able to take the CPU cooler off. Without even turning this thing on, I found it to be extremely interesting. And depending on how this performs, it could potentially be really useful in a variety of scenarios. Assuming this doesn't just chug power and the four core eight thread Ryzen chip is fairly capable, this could be a great addition to a budget home lab setup. 
You have the ability to have redundant storage with two SSDs, although you might be bottlenecked with one being SATA, but still. And with the PCIe slot, you could add additional networking or even a GPU for some transcoding tasks or something, or maybe even just some more solid state storage. It could also work well for running PFSense or OpenSense, but you should be warned that the integrated NIC is a Realtek RTL 8111, so it's not going to be the most compatible with FreeBSD. You could drop in a dual or quad gigabit Intel NIC though, and this could be a great candidate for a little OpenSense or PFSense box, or maybe even the forbidden virtualized router. This little guy might not just be relegated to home lab duties though. With the Ryzen chip and Vega graphics, I imagine this could work really well as, well, a thin client remotely streaming from another system, or maybe even itself functioning as a simple desktop. I mean, it does have four DisplayPort outputs, so those have to be there for a reason. And according to HP's docs, they could each support up to 4K60. So who knows, this might even be a fairly cheap little machine for a multi-monitor productivity fiend. There's only one way to find out, so I decided to get this thing plugged in and booted up. This was a little bit annoying because the system didn't come with a power adapter, and this HP system uses a pretty specific barrel jack size rather than a more standard like 5.5 by 2.1 millimeter barrel jack, so I had to order a power adapter off of Amazon. Once I got that plugged in, I booted it up, but unfortunately there was a BIOS password set. That wasn't a big deal though because I could just remove this little jumper, which reset the BIOS and removed the password. Now speaking of the BIOS, it was fairly limited in terms of settings, and really the only thing I found that seemed worth tweaking was enabling virtualization. Now obviously to install an operating system, I would need a boot drive. So I tried installing an NVMe SSD using these little blue screw NVMe holder things that HP has, where they're supposed to sort of clip onto the end of the SSD and then screw into place. But those were just terrible because they wouldn't really stay on the SSD and every time I would try to lower it down it would just barely bump the PCIe slot and then fall off. Oh my god! And it was just incredibly frustrating. So I eventually just switched to standard M2 screws because I'm a normal person that doesn't enjoy suffering. Now Windows wouldn't have been my first choice for a system like this, but it does let me install Hardware Info 64, which I find really helpful, and also lets me run Cinebench, which I have a lot of data that I can use for comparison. Before running any benchmarks though, I first noticed that when just sitting at idle, the system was drawing around 18 watts from the wall. That's quite a bit higher than I was hoping for, and well, maybe that 90 watt power supply really is necessary. In the older Cinebench R15, the HP T740 managed to score a 3 run average of 698. If we grab some numbers from an HP Elite Desk G3 Mini with an i5 6500T, and a Lenovo M715 Q Gen 2 with a Ryzen 2400GE, we see that the little embedded chip managed to outperform both of these pretty substantially. When moving to Cinebench R23, we see pretty similar results, even with the single-threaded performance. Although for some reason I don't have single-threaded numbers for the 2400GE. When it comes to Cinebench performance, the HP T740 shined. However, when it comes to efficiency, it was less of a shine and more of a red hot glow. Because both while at idle and when running Cinebench, the HP T740 managed to draw about double the amount of power as both of the other systems. So yeah, efficiency was pretty rough. But I found recently that these systems with integrated graphics can sometimes draw significantly less power when you don't have a display connected, especially when running Linux rather than Windows which is probably what you might be running if you were to use this as a home server or as a node in a cluster or something. So for that, I installed Proxmox. I started off as usual after the install by running the post install Proxmox helper script, but well, this time it stung a bit. That's because before starting this project, I learned that the creator of the Proxmox helper scripts, T-Tech, recently passed away. I really hate to see this as his work has greatly benefited me and I'm sure many of you as well. This is a huge loss for the entire self-hosting community, but I'm deeply grateful for all he's done and also thankful to the open source community for stepping up to maintain this project moving forward. After running the post install script, I also set the scaling governor to power save, ran the power top autotune function, and then rebooted the system without the DisplayPort cable plugged in to try to get the idle power draw as low as possible. This did help, but it only brought idle power draw down to around 11 or 12 watts. That's not terrible by any means, but still higher than what you might expect from a system like this. Before running any VMs or containers, I upgraded the RAM from a measly 8GB to 32GB, and while I had the case open, I also wanted to try out installing a PCIe card. My first thought was to drop in this quad 2.5GB NIC, but I was having trouble getting it to fit. I thought the issue might have been this little annoying thing that, well, I still have no idea what these are for, but still after removing that, the card wouldn't slot into place. It turns out this little opening for the bottom of the bracket was just a little bit too skinny. To see if something else would fit, I grabbed the closest low profile card I had on hand, which just happened to be an Intel Arc A310. This did fit, but I wasn't really expecting it to work. 
and sure enough, it wasn't recognized. These art cards are a bit finicky, but I had a feeling this Quadro P620 wouldn't have any issues. It didn't have the half height bracket, so well, it was a little wobbly, but it seemed to work just fine. Now, I would be a little hesitant to try anything extremely demanding with the GPU, considering the 90 watt power limit, and you know the fact that the system is pretty capable of drawing close to that without a GPU. But still, you can put a graphics card in here. While the case was open, I also wanted to see if the M.2 E key slot would support PCIe, so I tried dropping in this 2.5 gigabit NIC. Sure enough though, that little daughter board was in the way, so I had to remove it. Sometimes slots like this will only support things like C and VI for Wi-Fi cards, but this one does fortunately support one lane of PCIe Gen 3. And I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but the NVMe slot supports PCIe Gen 3x4, and the PCIe slot supports PCIe Gen 3x8. Back in Proxmox, I was able to set up a simple VM for Home Assistant, which had no issues. I also spun up an LXC container running Jellyfin, and this worked fine for just direct streaming, but, well, AMD isn't typically the best choice when it comes to hardware accelerated transcoding, and this system is no exception. When transcoding a 4K H.264 file down to 1080p, I was only getting around 30 frames per second. Also, I found that if I had hardware accelerated transcoding enabled, I wasn't able to get tone mapping working, so playback for HDR content just looked washed out. Now, I guess I could have tried passing through that Quadro card, but while well, getting NVIDIA cards working properly on a Jellyfin LXC container can be a bit annoying, and honestly, if you're trying to add something like that to the system, well, you're probably just much better off looking at something else entirely. What I did instead was drop in a 10 gigabit SFP Plus card. Then, after making sure IOMMU was enabled, I passed it through to a Debian VM, set up Samba, and then connected to an SMB share over the 10 gig card. I wasn't able to get the full 10 gig speeds, probably due to just a little bit of overhead, but it still seemed to be working pretty well. If you don't care about hardware accelerated transcoding and the power draw isn't a concern, this could be a pretty handy little system for your home lab. The CPU can hold its own and shouldn't have any issues running a handful of VMs or containers. Plus you have quite a bit of options when it comes to storage and expandability. But home servers aren't everything and sometimes you just need a simple but snappy desktop. For that, I installed Linux Mint, and yeah, this thing was pretty darn snappy. Browsing the web was an absolute breeze, and both 1080p60 and 4K30 YouTube playback were buttery smooth. I couldn't test the four 4K display outputs because, well, I don't have a single 4K display, let alone four, but based on my experience, I would assume this little thin client would handle it just fine. I also installed Moonlight to see how well this could handle streaming from my desktop PC, and while it does look a little bit weird because I was streaming from my 1440p desktop to a 1080p monitor, but there was no noticeable latency when doing something productive like editing a video. I also did some game streaming, and while the latency here was still really good, and I even managed a few headshots, I could still notice that the frame rate was just getting ever so slightly choppy. Still, this would be just fine for streaming some casual games to your living room or something. But rather than streaming games, why not just play them? I mean, this thing does apparently have a relatively powerful CPU, and it has integrated Vega graphics. Well, I didn't know exactly what I was expecting here, but, well, I guess I at least assumed a 2D title like Hollow Knight would run fairly well, but that wasn't the case. Now, it's a little hard to tell here because the final YouTube video is at 30 frames per second, but regardless of what the FPS counter was showing in the corner, it felt like I was getting like maybe 25 to 40 frames per second. Assuming maybe it was just a weird Linux issue with Hollow Knight, I switched over to Rocket League. The FPS counter getting stuck in the middle of the display wasn't a great sign, but on the lowest settings at 1080p, well, it was sort of playable. It was a similar situation to Hollow Knight, where it felt like I was getting around 30 frames per second or so, but the frame counter often showed a solid 60. I even switched back over to Windows to see if that was the issue, but well, that might have made things worse. At least here, the frame counter seemed to reflect what I was actually experiencing. I wanted to have a good experience playing something, so I installed Batacera for some emulation. Oh, and I also installed this on a SATA SSD, just to confirm that that worked as well. Emulation with retro consoles like the NES worked great as you might expect, but when I jumped over to the N64 for some Mario Kart, it was pretty sluggish. You might assume that something even more modern like the PS2 would be worse, but well, that worked really well, at least after making sure the emulator was using the Vulkan API. With Vulkan, I was getting buttery smooth gameplay with PS2 titles, as well as with PSP emulation. Really, just emulators that had support for Vulkan. This video is definitely not a deep dive into emulation, and maybe I could have tweaked some more settings, but I think the main point here is that this might work well for emulation, but it's going to be hit or miss depending on what you're trying to emulate, and it's not going to be a nice, simple, plug-and-play solution. Overall, I found this system to be, well, just a bit odd. It definitely doesn't perform how you would expect for a system labeled as a thin client that sports an embedded CPU, 
especially when you consider other systems that launched around the same time that weren't marketed as thin clients and even have socketable CPUs. If you're looking for a used, cheap, low-power mini PC, this really isn't that great of an option. It draws over twice the power of some pretty similar systems, it isn't really that small, and the Vega graphics are a bit hit or miss. I'm sure there are a few specific scenarios where the AMD graphics might be helpful, but for a lot of things like transcoding performance, power draw, and general compatibility, Intel is probably going to be a better bet. Really, this system only makes a lot of sense if you either need a simple desktop with four video outputs, or if you really just want to have a PCIe slot in a system that's relatively small. That being said, I still think the PCIe slot is pretty freaking cool. Regardless of how useful this system really is, I had a lot of fun messing around with it, and I hope you enjoyed watching this video as well. If you did, maybe consider liking, subscribing, or even becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.